we pick the book of Daniel to go through. And I'll tell you, there's a few factors at play. And one of them, frankly, I mean, we, we hope is a spiritual factor. We pray, we seek the Lord, and we seek some kind of impression or guidance from the Holy Spirit. What would you have us teach the congregation, you know, into this thing? We, we're committed to the principle of teaching verse by verse through books of the Bible. And not that we're against an occasional topical or topical series. Nothing wrong with that at all. But the foundation of the teaching ministry want to be verse by verse through books of the Bible. So we're thinking, okay, Lord, and we, we just trust that God has guided us in a spiritual sense as we've sought him. But there's also a couple other practical considerations at play. Uh, one of the practical things is we, we kind of look and say, ha- has it been a while since we taught this book of the Bible on a Sunday morning in the congregation? Because, I mean, that's relevant. We, we just don't want to have a cycle every two years we teach the same books of the Bible. We want to give people a comprehensive view of what the Bible says because all of it is given for our benefit as believers in our walk with God. But then also because we feel that God has something specific to say to this congregation and to this community through the major themes of that particular book of the Bible. And I can say I'm kind of excited about those particular aspects, thinking about the book of Daniel, because I, I see some goals that we have, some themes that we look to develop through this series of Daniel. Number one, we want to see just what it is to have a life lived for God and lived without compromise. I mean, that's kind of why we're titling this series Without Compromise. And you see a lion up there suggesting not just Daniel in the lion's den, which of course we'll get to in due time, but the boldness of a lion. And I don't know if you saw the beautiful painting out there by Kelly Claus in our hallway. Isn't that great? It's just a great suggestion of this boldness to live a life without compromise. Of course, that's a big theme throughout the book of Daniel, and we want to talk about that. But then there's also the idea of the book of Daniel teaching us what it means to live for God in a time of exile. I'm going to talk about that a lot during our message this morning because I think the opening of the book of Daniel deals with that. But there is a sense in which we as believers live now in a culture and we as followers of Jesus Christ are somewhat, I don't want to say altogether, I don't want to exaggerate it, but somewhat we are in a state of exile. There was a time when our culture was much more committed to biblical values, to biblical truth than it is now. And in some ways, again, I don't want to exaggerate it, But it's certainly true that in some ways, the culture is saying, your God has no place in our culture. Your your word has no place among us. You guys are on the outside. Now we dominate the culture. And there's a sense, at least somewhat, I should say, that we live in exile. I think that the book of Daniel is going to speak to us about what it means to live for God in a time of exile. There's a third reason why I think that that this series has something exciting for God to speak to us. It's that I I really believe that we're going to see here on Sunday mornings as we make our way through the book of Daniel, the idea that God has a plan and that in his word, he gives preview announcements of that plan. The, The book of Daniel is remarkable for being a book of prophecy. In other words, God predicting events and empires and great movements of history and spectacular events and God's plan through the ages of announcing those things. And some of those things that Daniel will talk about have already been fulfilled. Some of them have yet to be fulfilled. And I think it's important and exciting for us to get a good grasp on This whole concept of the Bible speaking what we would call prophetically, talking about things that are to come, even if some of them in the past have already been fulfilled. But then fourthly, and you know, this might be a great big, well, of course, David, but I don't want it to be an of course, David. I want it to be something we think about. Fourthly, we want to make sure that as we study the book of Daniel, just like everything, we look for Jesus in the midst of it all. Daniel is an amazing man in the Old Testament. We're going to learn a lot about Daniel, and God's going to speak to us through the life of Daniel. But ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, we are not Danielians. We're Christians. As great as a man as Daniel was, and as much as God used him in his plan for the ages, Daniel did not die on a cross for our sins. 
Daniel's not our redeemer. Jesus Christ is. And so we got a lot to learn from Daniel, but one of the things we do is we want to look to how this message of Daniel will point us towards and make us think about the person and the work of Jesus Christ. So with that, I'm just going to pray very briefly, and then let's get into Daniel chapter 1, verse 1. Father in heaven, we're grateful, Lord. We're grateful for how you speak to us in and through your word. And we pray that now, Lord, I I just want to dedicate this whole series, Lord, over the next 20, 22 weeks, whatever it is, this whole series, Lord, we dedicate it unto you. And we ask that you teach us in and through it. Do a great work in our congregation through this series of the book of Daniel. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Daniel chapter 1 beginning at verse 1. In the third year of the king of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God. And he brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. Whenever we study a book of the Bible, there's always a sense that we're sort of almost, in the big story of God's plan, we're sort of parachuting down into the middle of that story somewhere. I mean, the the biblical story doesn't begin with Daniel and it doesn't end with Daniel. There's a lot that happened before and there's a lot that happens after. I mean, if you were to just uh, take a look at the middle movie in the Star Wars series, you, you should be aware there's some stuff that went on before and there's some stuff that takes place afterwards in the story. Well, it's the same way as we come to the book of Daniel. We're faced with a man named Daniel. We're faced with the great king of the Babylonians named Nebuchadnezzar. But, but what's God doing amongst his people before all of this? And let me give you a quick summation of this beginning at the approximate time of Joseph. Joseph was the last series we did through the Old Testament on a Sunday morning. So let me pick it up for you just from the life of Joseph to the time of Daniel. Joseph brought the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Jacob also known as Israel, to the land of Egypt. And they stayed there in the land of Egypt for about 400 years. And they grew from being a large family of about 120 people to being a nation of anywhere from 2 to 6 million people. So that was during their 400 years in Egypt. But then God raised up a man named Moses to lead them out of Egypt. And 40 years later, they came into the promised land, the land of Canaan. And we call it the promised land because God promised it to those great patriarchs of Israel, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who also had the name Israel. They came into the promised land and they lived without a human king for about 400 years. That's what we call the period of the judges. But after the period of judges, God began to raise up human kings for the people of Israel. And the first three kings were named Saul, David, and Solomon. And under those three kings, the tribes of Israel were united under one king. But then after the days of Solomon, there was a civil war. And the 12 tribes of Israel divided into two kingdoms. The northern kingdom was called the kingdom of Israel. It had 10 tribes. The southern kingdom was called the kingdom of Judah. And it had two tribes. The northern kingdom of Israel lasted for 209 years until the Assyrians came in and conquered them. The southern kingdom of Judah lasted for 325 years until Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon first invaded them. He first invaded them, he invaded them a second time, and then a third time, 20 years after the first invasion, he invaded for a final time and he completely conquered Jerusalem, destroyed the city, and depopulated the whole region. This is who we're talking about with verse 1, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. This was the mighty ruler of the Babylonian empire. And make no mistake about it, Nebuchadnezzar, his very name speaks about him being dedicated to the Babylonian gods. Nebuchadnezzar is a Hebrew transliteration of a Babylonian name that honors the Babylonian god Nebu. 
the, the Babylonians had lots of gods, and one of them was named Nebu, and it means Nebu protects the crown. I have my crown, my royal throne, because of the Babylonian god Nebu. This king, verse 1, he came to Jerusalem and be, he besieged it. This happened in 605 B.C., and it was the first but not the last encounter between Nebuchadnezzar and Jerusalem. There would be two later invasions, one about eight years later and the other one about another 10 years after that. Now, when Nebuchadnezzar came and invaded Jerusalem and he surrounded the city and was going to crush it by starving them out and conquering them over, he suddenly had to lift his siege and go back to Babylon because his father died. And he had to secure his own place to the throne, made sure nobody else would try to become king in his place. Nebuchadnezzar did something that was absolutely remarkable in the ancient world. He traveled 500 miles over land in two weeks. Again, when you're going by horse and by foot, 500 miles in two weeks, you're going fast. But he needed to make it back to Babylon fast, so he had to lift his siege and go back. But when he went back, he took with him certain things. Notice, first of all, he conquered the present king of Judah and set up a puppet king. Verse 2, it says, the Lord gave Jehoiakim king of Judah into his hand. Nebuchadnezzar didn't finish the job of conquering Jerusalem and Judah, but he established his power, his dominance over Judah. And why did he do it? It wasn't because Nebuchadnezzar was more powerful necessarily. It was because God wanted to bring his judgment against Jerusalem. Look at the phrase there in verse 2, and the Lord gave Jehoiakim king of Judah into his hand. Now, look, I, I know the geopolitical situation. I know the Babylonian Empire is this mighty empire with, with this great king and, and, and armies numbering into the hundreds of thousands. And I know that the kingdom of Judah is a little kingdom and doesn't have many soldiers and is nothing compared to this mighty geopolitical empire. But let me tell you something, folks. If God defended Judah against the Babylonians, it would have never fallen. God can take the smallest little thing and defend it against the mightiest thing and hold it together. But God promised his people that if they were to forsake him, he would give them over to his enemies. That was part of the terms of the old covenant that Israel made with God. And this is what God did. God allowed Jerusalem and Judah to be conquered by the Babylonians. Why did he do this? He did this for two main reasons. First of all was Israel's great idolatry. Ladies and gentlemen, back in these days, Israel was constantly troubled by idolatry. There were many gods of the Canaanites that the Israelites worshipped. And rarely did they say, well, forget about Yahweh, the covenant God of Israel. Forget about the Lord God. We'll only serve these idols. Usually they just wanted to combine it all. But God said, no, I want you to combine it. God said, no, you will worship me alone. But the people said, no, we want to worship you, Yahweh, and Baal. We want to worship you, Yahweh, and Asherah. By the way, those were two of the idols that Israel was most tempted to go on after. Baal, sometimes you say Baal, but Baal and Asherah. What was so attractive about Baal and Asherah? I know I've told you this before, but I don't mind telling you it again because I think it's so relevant. Baal was an attractive god to the Israelites because he was the Canaanite god of weather. Matter of fact, they often depicted Baal with a thunderbolt in his hand. He's the God that sent lightning. He's the God that sent rain. And in an agricultural society where everybody depended on rain for their crops and their livestock, you didn't have rain, you didn't eat. They, they couldn't get uh, water from the Colorado River or from the Sierra Nevadas. If it didn't rain, you didn't eat. And so people had this in mind. If I don't do my business with the weather god of the Canaanites, I'm not going to get any rain. But if I get lots of rain, my bank account's going to be nice and big. If I get lots of rain, I'm going to be prosperous. If I get lots of rain, I'll be successful financially. 
So money, financial success, that's what it came down to in the worship of Baal. Now, what about Asherah? Well, Asherah was the goddess of fertility. And it was also related to agriculture because you wanted your um, crops to be fertile. You wanted your livestock to be fertile. But that wasn't the only hook, so to speak, with Asherah. The other thing that attracted people to worshiping Asherah was the way in which she was, quote, unquote, worshiped. Since she was a goddess of fertility, people so-called worshiped Asherah by going to cultic prostitutes, by having immoral orgies. That's how you worship, so to speak, Asherah. So what was the attraction of Asherah? Sex. The, the attraction of Baal was money, financial success. The attraction of Asherah was sex. Aren't you glad that the worship, the idolatry of sex and money ended with ancient Israel? <laughs> This is why I love explaining about this because it just shows how modern today this is. How it's exactly the same. How people still idolize. They make idols out of money and sex just like the ancient Israelites made idols out of Baal and Asherah. In any regard, they were given all these idols. God said, no, you, you can't do this. I, I'm going to bring this. You need to worship me and me alone. And so God allowed the severe judgment to come on them, mainly because of the people of Israel's great idolatry. There was another reason I'm just going to bring up very quickly. God had also appointed or commanded, I should say, ancient Israel to give Sabbath rest to the land. You're familiar with the idea that one day in seven was to be a day of rest? Well, God also said concerning the land of Israel that one year in seven you should give the land a rest. Man, that was organic farming before it was cool. Give the land of Israel a rest. Let it renew. Let it regenerate. Don't deplete the soil of all its nutrients and it'll be fertile for a long, long time. Well, the ancient Israelites did not do that. They did not give the land its Sabbaths. So basically God said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to kick you all out of the land and give its land its Sabbaths that have been stored up for hundreds of years. And then the land will get its Sabbaths back. Okay, those are kind of side issues. But these are why God said, I'm not going to defend Jerusalem or Judah in front of the Babylonians. They will be exiled out of the land. But friends, that's not only it. Look with me, please, at verse 2, where it says that when they left, he took some of the articles of the house of God. Now, Nebuchadnezzar didn't take all the furnishings of the temple, only some of them. But it was still a powerful statement. When Nebuchadnezzar went into the temple and took some of the articles of the house of God, I don't know, the altar of incense maybe, maybe the menorah, I don't know exactly what he took out of there, but he took some of the articles of the house of God, he went into the temple, took them out, and he took them back to Babylon, and he set them in his God's temple. That was a very powerful declaration. This was the declaration. The gods of the Babylonians are mightier than the God of Israel. Hey, Israel, your God, loser could not defend you against the God of the Babylonians. When it comes down to an arm wrestling match between the God of the Babylonians and the God of Israel, let me tell you who's going to win. We all know, don't we? Who conquered who? Whose treasures are in whose temple? And everybody, at least looking on it from the outside, had reason to believe that Israel's God was weak, that Israel's God was a loser. But ladies and gentlemen, you can think whatever you want to about the God who actually reigns in heaven. You can think whatever you want to about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You might think he's a loser. You, you might think he's weak. You might think he can't do what he wants to do. But let me tell you, God will prove you wrong every time. And even though this conception was going out throughout all the world that the God of Israel was a weak loser, God said, no, I'm going to show you my power. I'm going to show you my might. And he does that throughout the book of Daniel. Now, Nebuchadnezzar did not only take the treasures of the temple, you could also this say this, he took the treasures of the kingdom. And what do I mean by that? I mean he took the best and the brightest of a young generation. Look at this in verses three and four. It says, then the king instructed Ashpenaz, 
the master of his eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles, young men in whom there was no blemish, but good-looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand, who had ability to serve in the king's palace and whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. Now notice, he said, bring some of the children of Israel. Nebuchadnezzar not only took the treasures from the temple, he took the best and the brightest of the next generation that would be raised up there in Jerusalem and in Judea. And he selected young men from perhaps 13 to 20 years old, and he said, you are going away from your homes in Jerusalem, and you're going to come and live in Babylon, and you're going to work for me. This was exile. Moving from where you grew up and where you lived and traveling hundreds of miles away to come to a strange culture with a strange language, with strange customs and a strange religion and say, now this is your new home. There is some analogy, and again, it's not a complete analogy, but there's some analogy to what we see happening between refugees from the Middle East right now flooding into Western Europe. Now, there's significant differences because the refugees that are fleeing from the Middle East into Western Europe, they're doing it because they want to. They're doing it because they're hoping for a better life. But let me tell you something. The people that came from Jerusalem to Babylon in this exile that Daniel was taking, they didn't have any choice about it. Nobody asked Daniel and his compatriots, would you like a better life in Babylon? There was no choice. We're taking you and you are essentially coming as captives or slaves and you're going to serve in the royal court of the king of Babylon. But understand what a traumatic thing this would have been for Daniel and his compatriots. The temple that served your people for 350 years, it's gone. The community that valued God's word and the worship of Yahweh, it's gone. A culture that at least gave some credit to God, it's gone. Your Hebrew schools and the culture that came from that, it's gone. The institutions that God used to teach and help and bless his people, gone. And finally, the family and the generations that loved God and cared about you, gone. You are separated from all of that. All of that is back in Jerusalem, and now you live as an exile in Babylon. So I took them. Verse 4 says that they, they took the ones who had the ability to serve in the king's palace. They, they were going to be uh, men who served in some ways the functions of the king. And these were young men that had hoped to raise their families among the people of God. But now the best and the brightest were forced to sit, serve the pagan king of Babylon. Now I got to say, on Nebuchadnezzar's part, this is pretty smart. You get the best and the brightest all over the Middle East to come to your thing. It's like an all-star team of a young generation. That's a smart way for a king to think. But it's also this. You have people who are essentially hostages so that the people back in Jerusalem don't get too rebellious. If they get too rebellious, maybe Daniel and all his friends find their throats slit one day. So it's a very smart move on Nebuchadnezzar's part. But on the part of Daniel and his friends, ladies and gentlemen, this exile was devastating. See, how do you react to exile? Exile might make you despair. Oh, man, I guess our God is a loser. Look at that. The gods of this world, the gods of this age, they seem to be the ones in power. The way the culture goes, nobody cares about the God of the Bible anymore. He's not winning. It doesn't look like it anymore. Daniel and his friends could have been tempted to that kind of despair. Exile could make someone bitter or hateful. I hate the Babylonians, and maybe even I hate God for not protecting me. Daniel was tempted to think that way as an exile. Exile could also make someone forget about everything. Listen, all I care about is the here and now. 
I'm going to survive, I'm going to cope by eliminating every memory of Jerusalem and the temple and the word of God and the service of God. And all I'm going to do now is think about Babylon. It could make somebody react that way. Or Babylon, excuse me, exile couldn't make another person give up. What's the use? (laughs) If our God's not winning, why am I even in the fight? What's the use? I give up. I surrender. Or finally, I could think that exile might make someone give in. Hey, everybody, let's be Babylonians now. They seem to have the winning side. But why don't we just give up our distinctiveness from the word of God and the people of God? Let's just all be Babylonians now. Ladies and gentlemen, here's the good truth. The good word is that Daniel was a man who did not compromise. He didn't despair. He didn't become bitter and hateful. He didn't forget. He didn't give up. He didn't give in. He stood like a rock, and God used him in a mighty way. Well, let's take one more look here at verses 5, 6, and 7, and see what happened next to these Hebrew young men. Verse 5. And the king appointed for them daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank, and three years of training for them, so that at the end of that time they might serve before the king. Now, from among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. To them, the chief of the eunuchs gave names. To Daniel, he gave the name Belshazzar. To Hananiah, Shadrach. To Mishael, Meshach. And to Azariah, Abednego. So, notice two things going on here. First of all, we read in verse 5 that the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies. Basically, these guys got a meal ticket to eat in the king's cafeteria. That's pretty cool. I mean, listen, if you get to eat what the highest person in the land is eating, you're eating pretty good. Especially in the ancient world when there was a huge difference between the food that the royalty ate and the poor ate. A huge difference. Now again, they've got a meal ticket to the king's cafeteria. That's pretty great. That's the first thing they get is the king's food. But notice this, they also get new names. Verse 7, to them the chief of the eunuchs gave names. You see, each one of these guys, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, they all had names that were connected with the God of Israel. And listen, you you can't have a name connected with the God of Israel now that you're in exile in Babylon. We're going to give you new names. We're going to give you a new identity. We're going to tell you who you are. I know you came here from Jerusalem thinking you know who you are, but let me tell you who you're going to be. We're going to give you new names. So look at the new names they gave them. They went from the name Daniel, which means God is my judge, and they called him Belteshazzar, meaning Bel's prince. Bel was another Babylonian god. Well, what are you going to be? Are you going to be the God of Israel is my judge, or are you going to be the prince of some Babylonian God? Then they had this fellow Hananiah. Hananiah, his name means beloved by Yahweh, beloved by the Lord. And it was changed to Shadrach, which means illuminated by the sun God. What's it going to be? And then they had this guy, Mishael. Mishael, his name meant who is as God. And it was changed to Meshach, meaning who is like Venus. Venus was just the Babylonian name for Asherah, the goddess of fertility. And then they had Azariah, meaning the Lord is my help. And his name was changed to Abednego or Abednego, meaning the servant of Nego. What are you going to be? Are you going to identify with the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, of Jacob? Or are you going to let the system of the exile press its identity upon you and tell you who you are? This was the great challenge for Daniel and his friends. This is what it was all about. Look at verse 5. It says that they had three years of training for them. They had three years of training. 
They ate in the king's cafeteria. They were supposed to answer to their new names and their new identities. And this was an effort at total indoctrination. The goal was to make these young Jewish men leave behind their Hebrew God, leave behind their Hebrew culture. And Nebuchadnezzar wanted to communicate to these young men, look to me for everything. Don't you look to the God of Israel. He let you down. He's a loser. I, I will be your source. Daniel and his friends steadfastly refused and they insisted that they would look to God. How did they do it? Join us next week for our next installment in Without Compromise Part 2. Friends, brothers, sisters, the message is pretty clear to us today, isn't it? There's at least a sense. Again, I don't want to exaggerate because I don't think it's true in every sense. But there's at least a sense in which we are a people in exile. We live in a world that more than 10 years ago, more than 20 years ago, more than 50 years ago, says We don't want your God. We don't want your Bible. You don't run things around here anymore. We're people in exile, at least in some respect. So how are we going to meet that challenge? Listen, today, the world around us says to us, let me train you. Come into my school and I'll train you. Just like Daniel and his friends were supposed to be trained. But what does Jesus say? Jesus answers and he says, you come and be my disciple. That's a choice for everybody in this room to make. Are you going to be a disciple of Nebuchadnezzar of this world? Or are you going to be a disciple of Jesus Christ? The world comes to us today and it says, look to me for everything. All your needs, body, soul, and spirit, I'll meet them. That's what the world promises. But what does Jesus say? Jesus says, no, look to me. I am your Savior. I am your God. The world around us says to us today, let me tell you who you are. But Jesus answers back and he says, no, no, no. Let me tell you who you are. Who's going to define your identity? The world and the culture around you or Jesus himself? And finally, the world around us says, your God is a loser. Your God is probably dead. Forget about him. You know what Jesus says? Jesus says, I am alive and I am active. Just you see. Because ladies and gentlemen, the truth of the matter is, Jesus is alive. Jesus is active. Jesus reigns on high after having ascended to heaven. Jesus rules and reigns. And if you will put your trust and your attention on him, you will see the dramatic things that Jesus Christ will do in your life. The great thing about this is that in the contest between the God who really is and the false gods of the exile world, that you can just put it to the test Because the God who really is will come through again and again and again. And we're going to see it throughout the book of Daniel. God has an invitation to each and every one of you. Don't look to the world. Look to Jesus. If you feel like you're in a time of exile in the broader culture, do not despair. Do not become hateful. Do do, do not lose your hope. Jesus Christ has a purpose even in the midst of the exile and you can look to him in the midst of all of it. Now, in a moment, I'm going to pray. Um, When I pray, our worship team is going to come here on the platform and then after our prayer, we're we're going to play a couple more worship songs and invite you to come and worship the Lord. Um, When we do that, I'm going to give a very simple invitation for anybody here amongst us who would like to surrender their life to Jesus Christ. Jesus made a promise that if you would follow him, if you would follow him, if you would put your trust in him, if you would look to him and what he did for you on the cross, 
that he would change your life and that he'd be your rescuer, your salvation, both now and for all eternity. This is the promise of Jesus. That God so loved the world that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This is God's promise for you and for me. And I just feel that a, a message like this that gives us a clear marking point between the thinking of this world and the offer of Jesus Christ, we need to give a clear invitation if anybody would surrender their life to Jesus Christ. So I'll ask for that in just a moment. And uh, I just want you to prepare your own heart for it. I don't want you to feel manipulated into it. But I want to say, yes, this is my morning to make a decision for Jesus Christ. Let's pray together right now. Father in heaven, um, I ask again, Lord, for your blessing upon this entire series as we teach through the book of Daniel. But Lord, I, I thank you for how you've shown us here this morning that even though we may live in the midst of a culture that doesn't value you or, or, or feels that you've lost in some way, Lord, it does not change for a moment that you reign on the throne from heaven. And so we look to you, Lord God. We bring every fear, we bring every um, confusion, we bring every, every doubt of our hearts unto you, and we just simply say, Jesus, help us to live for you, even if it should be in some way a season of exile. Help us to live for you, Lord, without compromise. Jesus, that can only happen as you fill our lives. So do it now as we surrender unto you in Jesus' name.